Welcome back to iGen Politics. This is a podcast that makes politics engaging and relevant for all generations. My name is Victor Shi, a sophomore at UCLA and the youngest elected delegate for Joe Biden. And I'm Jill Wine Banks, an MSNBC legal analyst and the author of The Watergate Girl. And also, I'm the person who wears hashtag Jill's pins. And today's pin uh, we'll post on our um, show notes so that you can actually see it. It's a little hard to see, but it is a house, sort of a fancy house, with a palm tree next to it and an alligator about to invade it. And the follower who sent it to me said, it's Mar-a-Lago and the swamp, but it's also Mar-a-Lago and the danger that it poses. And I'm wearing it because our guest today is Mary Trump, an author of two books, and someone who we're very excited to talk to for the second time. After four years of um, her uncle, President Trump, deepening divisions within the country and empowering people to say things that would have been unthinkable before he became a candidate in 2015, uh, America needs to find a way to heal. And Mary's new book, addresses that. Um, but how can we heal when polarization is more severe than it has ever been at any time, probably since the Civil War? Um, maybe, you know, worse than Vietnam for sure, when there was divisions that I saw as a young person. But how do we heal when we can't even agree on basic facts, when we're being fed total disinformation and Many people believe those, what they call alternative facts, which I call lies, because I believe you have to call things what they are, which is a point that Mary makes in her book. And um, when the person who is leading the country is the one who's really endangering our democracy. With experience in clinical psychology and Anise's insights into former President Trump, Mary Trump joins us to answer those questions and share how we can reckon with hard truths and come together as a nation. Jill and I are delighted to welcome Mary back on the podcast. She gave a clear-eyed psychological assessment of Donald Trump the last time she joined us on iGen Politics, and she was one of your favorites as well. So when we heard her new book, The Reckoning, Our Nation's Trauma and Finding a Way to Heal, came out, we both knew we needed to have her back on. We have lots to discuss. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here, Mary. Oh, it's my pleasure. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Oh, we're thrilled to hear that. And we're so excited. But the last time we talked with you was in December of 2020, which seems like a whole universe of time ago. Um, we were already I aware. I think it was 5,000 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> it feels like that, or at least in the terms of uh, Karl Reiner, the 2,000-year-old man. Uh, but we were already aware that the former president was trying to undo the election of 2020 by then. Um, and no one, though, would have predicted uh, the last stuff that has happened, including, of course, January 6th and our Capitol building being desecrated by supporters of his uh, who followed his instructions, which were to march up Pennsylvania Avenue and fight like hell in an attempt to overturn the results of the election. And I'm just wondering from your perspective as both a relative and a psychologist, what what was your reaction to January 6th and were you at all surprised that his followers did this? I wasn't surprised. Um, what what I'd been saying since I think before the 2020 election, but certainly after Donald lost so badly to President Biden, was that if he felt that he was going down, he would stop at nothing to take the rest of us down with him. Um, that sense was exacerbated by the fact that Overall, the Republican Party outperformed not just expectations, but him. Uh, so there was really nobody he could blame. Not that he wouldn't try, of course, but that would make him a little bit more <gasps> desperate. It would increase the sense of humiliation. So, you know, there was no way to know exactly how it was going to play out. But the, the insurrection, when it did happen, didn't surprise me because, as you, you both know, Donald has been stoking 
anger, manufacturing, mm -hmm. rage, um, and lying to people about what was quote unquote stolen from them, that it didn't really take much. I don't think, mm -hmm. um, as usual though, the thing I seriously, I totally feel the whole Lucy with the football thing that I yeah. am constantly accusing Democrats of, of doing over and over again, but I keep doing it too. I was, what did surprise me was the fact that the Republican party one, let him get away with the first big lie. Um, and two, uh, perpetuated it, which made something like January 6th even more likely. So what, the, the one thing that I always wonder is, what is it about him and about his followers that allows this to happen, that they become so attached to him that they will do anything he says, that they will believe anything he says, even when the facts are so clear? I don't really like thinking about Donald, but uh, circumstances <laughs> prevent me from being able to forget him. Um, what I finally realized is that you can't figure out what's going on with him if you're looking through the perspective, from the perspective of somebody who's sane and empathetic. Um, it's not like his followers see in him wonderful qualities that we just don't see. It's that they the things they value in him are the things we revile. They value his his ability to tell lie after lie after lie. They love the fact that he gets away with everything. And I think one of the things they most love about him, and it's so weird for me to use that word in conjunction with him, love, um, since he doesn't know what it is, but um, they love the fact that he's this incredibly weak person who, despite that, has been allowed to succeed to the extent that he has. So. If you look at it like that, it makes more mm. sense. These are people who have been primed to be hateful um, for decades from, uh, you know, the Republican Party, from the media. And we finally um, got to this point with them where they're so dedicated that they're willing to put themselves at risk. And that's not, that's not an accident. And it's not something that happened right away. Donald is expert at forcing people to make micro concessions. First time you meet him, he'll say, whether it's his plane or his, what, isn't this the best thing you've ever seen in your life? You don't want to be rude. You say yes. So he's sort of got a little hook in you. The other thing he does is he makes microaggressions about against people. First, it's, you know, if you want to be in my circle, if you want to feel connected to me, then you have to hate these people. And then over time, it's, you have to come to my rally and be perfectly willing to let me abandon you in the freezing cold <laughs> or the heat. And then it's, you need to, in order to prove your loyalty to me, you have to go to a rally without a mask in the middle of a pandemic, putting your life and the lives of those you love at risk. Wow, that is a powerful and insightful analysis. Uh, is there any hope? Is there any approach? Is there anything that would convince his followers what the truth is, what facts are? I mean, how do we get back to anything approaching uh, a life that's based on facts and reality. One of the things we need to remember is that this is not something Donald did by himself. I, uh, this is, this is in large part down to the Republican party, which has enabled him at every turn. Yeah. Think about how many off ramps were offered to them that they've refused to take. I, uh, you know, so I think, yeah. The only reason he's still relevant is because they're keeping him relevant. They're keeping him empowered. So the other problem that we're contending with is the fact that, you know, in, in any typical society, there, there are going to be 22 to 28 percent of us who are, as Hillary Clinton said, or as I like to refer to her, President Hillary Clinton said, <laughs> are the deplorables. You know, they're the white supremacists. They're the KKK, the Proud Boys, the neo-Nazis. Liberal democracy is supposed to contain them. From 2017 to 2019, 
the worst among us were represented by 100% of the federal government. And not only that, they were championed. Their views were yeah. espoused and championed by the leader of the free world. So that disease has metastasized, which is one reason he got 12 million more votes in 2020 than he did in 2016. Yeah. How do we reverse that? Um, I think there are a few things we can do. One is the Democrats need to govern as if they had the majority, which they do. They need to make people's lives better, show people that the government is not some foreign entity out to get them, but is actually us. And that the foreign government, the foreign government, uh, sorry, <laughs> our government, which is not a foreign entity, <laughs> is a force for good in their lives. Yeah. You know, it's it's not something that that should be drowned in a bathtub because it's us. It it helps people, you know. And and I think once people begin to see again that um, their lives can be made me- better in a substantive way if um, Democrats are allowed to lead for more than five minutes and not play to the center, uh, that could also be a huge um, bomb for us. And the other thing that needs to happen is we need to redefine what us versus them means. Donald loves chaos and division. He thrives on it. At this critical moment in our history, when we most needed to be united during COVID, he decided to make us Donald supporters versus them, Democrats, people of color, immigrants, whatever. So we just need to define us as America and them as COVID. You know, um, I think that that could go a long way as well. I, I love what you said about he didn't do this alone and how the Republicans have enabled him, but how he has empowered all the worst in America and um I think that's a good lead in to start talking about your new book, The Reckoning. Uh, and, and Victor has some first questions on that. Yeah, so so let's turn to the brand new book, The Reckoning, which explores how our nation can heal after four years of President Trump and also generations of injustices, inequality, and hardship. Um, you discussed that you um, how we can come together as a nation after all of that. I'm wondering if that was your um, goal when you first wrote that book, um, and, and also maybe if January 6th changed anything about the content of your book um, afterward. Yeah, actually, when I first started, started writing the book, well, not writing it, but when I first came up with the idea for it in uh, September, October of 2020, things were really bad. Uh, we were heading into our second wave of covid over 200,000 Americans were dead, most of them needlessly. And we were heading into what was going to be the most important election of my lifetime, not really sure what was gonna happen. Uh, so we, we were dealing with these three interconnected crises, COVID, the economic fallout, and um, you know the fact that American democracy was at the precipice, which it still is, by the way. So I, I knew we were going to be in in lockdowns and stuff for a long time. I didn't know how long. I didn't know what was going to be happening with the anti-vax insanity. But I was very concerned after months and months of fear, uncertainty, um, anger, etc., that when we finally emerged, uh, we were going to be looking down the barrel of the worst mental health crisis this country has ever faced. And we're not equipped to deal with that at the best of times. You know, we have serious uh, issues dealing with mental health and mel- mental illness in this country. So that's that's the road I first started going down. And then I realized I, I didn't think I could do that in a way that was useful. So I thought I thought it could be more helpful to people uh, to try to make sense of how we got here. You know, how do how do we become so vulnerable to autocratic, incompetent, cruel people like Donald. You know, how did we get to this point in our history where one of our two major uh, po- political parties is is a party of fascists at this point, who are willing to follow the autocrat, you know, who has have as their goal uh, to cling to power no matter how um, ill-gotten it might be and create some kind of apartheid state. Um, so I felt that in... in Looking at the through lines from this country's inception to now, uh, the two major themes I saw were the fact that we've never held powerful white men accountable, starting with Robert E. Lee. And, um, you know, that's one reason we got to Donald. And we've never 
sufficiently acknowledge the strains of white supremacy that continue to have a huge impact on us to this day, whether we, we, by which I mean white people, recognize it or not. And those two things together led directly to somebody like Donald getting into a position of power. And the only way, I think, the only way we heal is to look that square in the face, acknowledge it, be adults about it, take responsibility for it, and and do something about it. We, we want to explore the concept of accountability later, but you, you mentioned also a really shocking fact about you um, within the first 10 pages. On page 7, um, you write, several months um, after my uncle was inaugurated, um, I made the decision to leave my home in New York and go to a treatment center in Tuscan that specialized in uh, PTSD, among other things. I would be there for weeks, ex- excavating decades-old wounds and trying to figure out why my uncle Donald's um, elevation to the White House had so undone me. Um, when did you realize that you had PTSD and needed treatment for it? Oh, I've known for years that I have PTSD. It's from something that happened long, long time ago. Um, and it has nothing to do with Donald <laughs> so or anybody uh, related to Donald. So um, it's not because he himself was the cause of something and that was the trigger. Uh, and I didn't really understand right away why, why it just, I was so undone by his elevation. And I realized it was something fairly simple. It's because once again, the worst among us was enabled to succeed at the highest levels. And that, you know, that's a theme I think that's shadowed me throughout my life and it made me crazy. Um, and again, you know, it, I think when you're in the middle of something and this is the problem we're facing now, we're still being traumatized. You can't deal with your trauma if you're still being traumatized. I was in the middle of it. So I, I was being triggered. I was having all sorts of symptoms, but I didn't realize it until somebody pointed it out to me. And uh, the the conclusion that I came to was either I deal with this now. I make the choice myself or somebody's going to make it for me. So what were the, like when you went to the treatment center, what were some of the mechanisms that helped you um, overcome your PTSD? And I guess, did, did those help you get through the four years of um, the Trump administration? Yeah. Um, you know, the thing about, and I have a complex PTSD, which is what a lot of us are going to have, because that means it's, 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 the trauma is sustained over time or occurs repeatedly over time Um, that you don't ever get cured from it. You just learn how to manage it and mitigate the symptoms and stuff. So uh, there's that, but you know, I I think um, a lot of the progress I made was undone by the last year and a half as well. So, you know, luckily I do still have some tools. And one of the things that I, I learned, one of the most important things that I learned is that you will never, um, get out from under your trauma unless you face it and feel the feelings that accompanied the original trauma, which, by the way, is one of the hardest things you can ask somebody to do. And that's kind of what I feel like we need to ask our country to do. Um, so it's not going to be easy. And the other thing was just being introduced to certain treatment modalities, which is weird because I have a PhD in clinical psychology, but I, you know, I, I knew that this thing called EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Um, I knew what it was, but it, it didn't fall under my purview. So it's not something I ever really thought to explore that uh, has been incredibly helpful. And, um, you know, I'm extraordinarily lucky. I have the ability and the, um, assets in order to have, to be in three different kinds of therapy to help me, um, you know, so that's that's why I worry so much about where we're gonna be in a few months or a few years. Cause you know, it's not just more people are gonna have PTSD than would otherwise. We're gonna be looking at elevated levels of depression, anxiety, substance abuse disorders, stress-related disorders, domestic abuse issues. I mean, it's it's terrifying to contemplate. And there's not, we don't have in place a system that is going to make the kinds of treatment necessary readily available and affordable to people, which is why I really think that um, President Biden needs to start a new uh, cabinet position to deal specifically with these issues. 
I agree. And it, are you feeling better now that your uncle's out of office and off of Twitter and Facebook and other social media platforms? Has that helped in any way um, with what you were experiencing? Um, let's put it this way. Uh, the fact that he's gone, well, he's not gone. The fact that he's out of office is huge because if he were still there, we would be a full blown autocracy uh, at the, at the moment, I, I believe. And I would probably have had to leave the country because I don't know if you've noticed, but Donald's pretty vindictive. So, you know, him, him in a second term would have been just absolutely devastating to this country. So yes, I am quite relieved. However, again, he isn't gone. He's still relevant. He's still being held in place by a, a completely craven Republican Party that feels that the, the only way for them forward going forward is to keep him uh, relevant and empowered. So, um, you know, obviously it's better than the alternative, but it's still pretty bad because uh, we can't let our guard down. We still need to be fighting. And we're all really tired. Boy, nothing is truer than that. Um, and and it's interesting because in reading your book, I expected it to focus more on or, or solely for it to have meaning in the context of politics. But I think I learned about how many of us, including me from my first marriage, suffered from PTSD and how to stop feeling victimized by it and to take control of it. Um, mm -hmm. And but but you do talk about the difference between uh, collective and individual trauma. And I found that equally fascinating. And so both as a psychologist um, and as someone who's gone through it personally, can you give us some more background on that and the difference between individual and collective trauma and what what's harder to deal with and how do we treat it? Um, so talk about that. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, assuming all things being equal and people have access to treatment, I think in, in some ways, if you have a good support system, it's dealing with individual trauma is a little bit more straightforward because you know your story and you know how it's, I mean, hopefully you are able to gain insights uh, with the, the right kind of help uh, into your symptoms, what triggers them, et cetera. Um, it's still hard. And I mean, this is one of the things about grappling with, PTSD. It said, you know, in order to get to the other side of it, you're you're essentially being asked to uh, relive your trauma, which is torture. You know, <laughs> so uh, it's it's not like it's simple or an easy ask, but it's more straightforward than dealing with collective trauma. Um, and I think we're we're dealing with two issues. Uh, I more, slightly more than half of us felt very traumatized by the election of 2016 and the results of the election. And we're continuing, continue to be traumatized by the breathtaking cruelty of Donald's administration. And the fact that, um, because I guess like nature, the media abhor a vacuum too, they needed to normalize him which was incredibly dangerous. So to, so to witness all of that was really traumatizing. And because it was only just maybe most of us, but not all of us, that was also very divisive. And it, was, it increasingly polarized us. And then comes COVID. And um, I think one of the most diabolical things Donald has ever done, other than you know purposely killing hundreds of thousands of Americans, is uh, divide us at that as I said, when we most needed to be united and politicize uh, life, very simple life-saving measures. Because pandemics are like wars in a sense. Um, they are sort of inherently unifying because we are all in it together, right? We're supposed to be all in it together. So even in our isolation, we, we would have been able to feel um, the, 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 the sense of um, being part of something, right? 
we we were all to varying degrees suffering the same fears and loneliness yeah. and isolation and and that would have helped a lot of people i think get through it better but of course that doesn't suit donald's purposes so we're now uh at a place where you know it isn't just because obviously we have experiences differently we're all going to emerge with different kinds of issues it's that um because of the the ways in which the right, particularly media on the right, and people like Donald um, spin and lie and misrepresent, um, a, a significant minority of us actually don't think that they've experienced the same thing they've experienced. Right. So again, how do you make common cause? And, and what do we do about that? Um, especially since it looks like you know, um, so many people are still going to refuse to get vaccinated that the trauma is going to be protracted and COVID is going to be with us forever. Well, it's interesting. I don't think I answered your question. No, you you (laughs) did. I mean, it's terrifying to me, of course. But, you know, when I think of um, collective trauma, I mean, you can go back to Pearl Harbor or 9-11, but Mm -hmm. The eruption of COVID was a collective trauma. January 6th was a collective trauma for almost all Americans, obviously not all. There's a substantial portion who think it was a terrific and good thing. Watching Afghanistan withdrawal is traumatic. Um, Mm -hmm. Seeing the risk that the Arizona, quote, audit, (laughs) Brings is a collective trauma. And I, mm-hmm. I'm just wondering whether there's a way that the country can deal with this, whether there are things that are causing us to lose empathy um, as a result of this. And how do, how do we make the country heal? Yeah, you mentioned September 11th, and which was, you know, one of the worst days of many people's lives, including mine. Um, September 12th, on the other hand, was one of the most extraordinary days I've ever lived. I I felt for the only time in my entire life that the whole planet was united with us. It lasted for about a minute because George W. Bush then decided he needed to squander that completely. But, you know, it was a really, it really helped towards the healing because we did have that. We don't have that with COVID. We don't have that with um, the uh, economic devastation. Uh, We don't have, like, we don't even, we don't even have the relief of having Donald disappear because he hasn't, you know, in, in international, in, in interviews with international media, they say, oh, wow, you know, it's so great not hearing from Donald. And I'm like, well, uh, maybe for you. But it's really different over here, guys. He's still there. So um, what do we do about it? Because the other problem with trauma is once you've been, um, once you've experienced it, it kind of um, softens the ground and leaves you even more vulnerable to ensuing traumas. Mm. So, you know, uh, that makes it harder to stay strong all the time. Um, which is why I think, you know, if if we do believe we're all in it together, we need to tap out when we need to. And, you know, whenever I feel like, oh, God, I can't deal with it anymore, I just, I just think about Black women. <laughs> you know, they never tap out, so I don't have any right to. Um, but we're, we're still at this really fraught period of time because people don't want to keep fighting. People don't want to keep being afraid. People don't want to keep um, being vulnerable to pain. Uh, and the sad irony, though, is if we do turn away, then we're going to wake up uh, after the election in 2022 and find that the Republicans t- have taken over the Senate and the House again. 
And because um, what I would add another another trauma that maybe not everybody's experiencing, but a lot of us certainly are, is the breathtaking cynicism of all of these voter suppression bills that are winding their way through state legislatures based upon the big lie. It's maddening. So again, I think how do we how do we get through this? Well, right now we need to win elections. Um 2022, like 2020, is now the most important election of my lifetime. And 2024 also will be. <laughs> so until we consolidate majorities that aren't vulnerable to the whims of a midterm election, you know, we're, we're going to be fighting this fight for a while, uh, which is why it would be really helpful. It would be really nice if, if the Democrats uh, acted as if they understood that the, we're in the middle of a national emergency. I, I think, I think they, that would also help people feel better. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. What I'm seeing happen, I, I know I get a lot on Twitter from followers who say, I'm just giving up. I can't take it anymore. I have to tune out. I'm not following the news as much. And to me, that's a real danger because it's only by tuning in that we can take actions that are appropriate and start realizing that it's not just federal elections, it is also state elections. If there are more and more Republican-led states, they ultimately have a lot of control, and it's terrifying. And as I was listening to you just now, something flashed through my mind that I know this is going to be risky to mention, but I, I started thinking about how people in Germany must have felt in the late 30s and early 40s. How did we get here? How did he take power? How did this happen to us, an educated, cultured society? And I have, I mean, that's my trauma right now, is worrying about losing everything that America has meant to me um, because there are more than 70 million people who believe that Donald Trump helped them somehow and that he's been cheated, um, even though, of course, they keep seeing the lack of evidence of any of that. There is no fraud. There is no all of that stuff. So um, I think we all need to deal with that trauma. And you talk about it in your book and talk about how when the person who had responsibility for the collective trauma is still around. And that's making our nation experience even more trauma, but turning away from it. How do we get people to turn into it? It's a really good, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Sebastian. Uh, where is, um, well, let's at least anyway. see him. Let's let, let our yeah, Facebook yeah. viewers. Yeah, appearance. <laughs> Where are you, Sebastian? We want to meet you. Yeah, he just wants the attention. Okay. Apparently, come here. What what kind of bird is he? Oh my wow. God, he's, he's an gigantic. Oh gray. What what is he? He's <laughs> a he's parrot. He's an African gray. <gasps> oh my God, he's beautiful with a red tail. Yep, yeah, he's uh, twenty four. Wow. And, um, wow. He's very handsome. He is. Oh my gosh. He has a very intelligent looking That's face. Amazing. He looks like They're an very owl. Smart birds. They have the intelligence of like a three year old human. Wow. Okay. <laughs> well, they, folks, if you're not watching this on Facebook, them. if you're not watching this on YouTube, you should be because <laughs> you can meet you can meet <laughs> Sebastian. Yeah, parrots are often described as toddlers with can openers attached to their faces. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's why when he starts nipping at my Achilles tendon, I get a little oh, oh, worried. Oh, dear. <laughs> okay, well, be a um, good boy, Sebastian. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so... <laughs> um, I think it it's an incredibly important question. And... You know, we can talk all we want, and this is largely about what my book is about, you know, facing things, facing the truth, 
and and only because only then can we move on. But that's very complicated. That's a long term project, and a lot of people are going to be very resistant to it. Yeah, because you know white privilege is a thing. Um, in the short term, though, I think one of one of the most uh, important things people can do is one get be, stay connected, and two do something meaningful. You know, if you need to turn off the news because it's too much, okay, fine. But you know what? Go register voters. Go go um, volunteer for refugee organizations, um, et cetera. I mean, there are so many ways. Uh, I mean, I personally, right now, obviously, you can do more than one thing. Um, if you need to do one thing, it's just we got to get people registered to vote because everything is at stake. And it, as you said earlier, it literally just needs... To, they just need to change things in Arizona, Georgia, and Pennsylvania, and it's over. So just do something proactive, um, and that's something that will absolutely because it help you. Because there's nothing worse in, in the context of the stuff we're talking about than feeling helpless and hopeless. It's demoralizing, and it feeds on itself, right? Yes. I mean, I think Benjamin Franklin said a very prescient quote, which is, you know, someone asked him, what kind of government do we have? And he said, a republic, if we can keep it. So I think a lot right. of this discussion is really incumbent, incumbent on us tapping mm -hmm. in and engaging rather than um, stepping to the sidelines. But um, I, I want to ask you about your passages on trauma in your book, because when I first read about those um, passages, I thought about QAnon and other far-right groups and how the weird thing is like despite repeated instances in which they're promised something that they wanted would happen, like Trump being reinstated or um, the election results being overturned, they never happened. And yet people still remain a part of those cult-like groups. And I'm wondering what you think, um, both given your background and, and um, what you know about Trump, what you think keeps them part of these groups despite promises not being kept to them? Well, I mean, that's something that happens in cults all the time, right? You know, the, the end days are going to happen on August 31st. Uh, we know it's been rescheduled. It, they're always doing that. And I think by the time people um, are at the point where they believe that, they've totally bought in. There's one thing about human beings that I is, is one of the hardest things to deal with. Human beings hate being wrong. They would rather double down on being wrong than admit they're wrong. <laughs> so um, it's it's partially because being wrong is humiliating. It doesn't. It just doesn't feel good, right? And I think the other problem is that the the right is incredibly good at keeping people afraid, um, and it's manufactured. I mean, the, you know, there aren't hordes and caravans coming to get you and rape your wife and vote Democrat. Uh, so the reason that's effective is because like being wrong, fear doesn't feel good. It feels terrible. You know, it feels good being angry. So they transform the fear into anger. They keep people riled up and it makes them much more vulnerable. You know, if you're really, really angry all the time, you know, you're you're susceptible to doing whatever you're told by the people you've put your trust in. And because what's the alternative? Imagine being one of these anti-mask, anti-vaccine, QAnon, what, Donald worshiping people, and then you find out the truth. Imagine the sense of betrayal or imagine if, you know, your children get sick really sick from COVID, people you love start to die from COVID, and you finally have to reckon with it, that truth, that that betrayal it would, I don't know, I think it would undo most people. I mean, one of the things that I think might help just in individual conversations, you mentioned the importance of language and how we can use language to combat um, this ex extreme just unhinged um, behavior by the Republican Party. Um, and I was actually going to read this passage of your book because it was so powerful, but I'm wondering um, if you might be able to read it, uh, if you have the book handy. It's um, on page 
124. If you don't have it, that's so. Um, it's over there. Okay. I mean, if you want me to go get it, I can uh, go get it. If or you I don't... can ask Sebastian to go get it. Yeah. Right. 124? Yeah, yes. so 124, I believe it's the last paragraph. Um, but Starting it's, with, it people, with tend. people tend. Yeah, and then it ends okay. with validity of the premise. Got it. People tend to shy away from language that seems extreme as if it's rude or using it would make them seem melodramatic or unhinged. If we don't call things what they are, if we don't use language honestly, we can't expect people to understand what's really going on. By failing to use language accurately, because it would be impolite or we don't want to offend anybody, we set up a situation in which describing the Republican Party as a party of fascists leads people to question the extremity of the language rather than the validity of the premise. I mean, it's such a powerful excerpt. And, and I guess the first question is, how important is it for elected officials of both parties, but especially Democrats, I think, to be calling things out as they are? Oh, my gosh. I, it's, I, I don't think I could overstate how important it is. And I would add also the media need to do this. And that's one of the many reasons, but an important reason we're here. How many years did it take for them to call Donald's lies laws? I don't believe they ever called his racism racism. Uh, I mean, some people did, but across the mainstream media in general, there was this massive reluctance to do that. And it's a mistake because the other thing that is that happens is Republicans are allowed to call Democrats, what is it now, socialist, communist, Marxist? Right. <laughs> you know? And they are never asked to define their terms. If um, somebody like Ruth ben Giat, who's an expert in authoritarianism, or uh, Sarah Kedzior, or Mike, um, Malcolm Nance, or people who actually understand better than I how these things operate, if they call uh, the Republican Party a party of fascists, which I believe they do, um, and are asked to define the term, they can, you know? And it gives context to what we're talking about as opposed to just being this both sides name calling nonsense. So I, it's so important. Definitely. I know Jill has a hashtag on Twitter, say this, not that, which is so important mm. now. It's just call things, if they're lies, they're lies. They're not, you know, right. uh, uh, alternative facts, call them lies. But I know right. Jill has a- yeah. I know Jill has a follow-up question to the media and how we can maybe talk to people in this polarized system. Sure. Right. Well, one of the things that I always ask our guests, because I struggle with it so much, is how can we change our media um, ecosystem? Many of the problems that you discuss in your book are made worse by the fact that there are certain outlets that are repeating all these lies. And I'm just yeah. trying to find the way that we can communicate to the people who read or follow Fox News, for example, and believe what they're hearing, despite the fact that evidence in court, what we would as lawyers, what I as a lawyer anyway, would call a fact, uh, are totally ignored by those outlets. Um, so I'm, I'm, I try to ask everybody smart, how can we fix that? What can we do? Uh, you know, uh, before the election, some people would ask me a similar question, but, you know, how, how do you, people who are going to vote for Donald again, what do you say to them? How do you, and, and my advice was don't bother, don't waste your time, which made me sad to say that, but I, I think it would, would have been a waste of time. We're in a different situation now, um, and just, uh, although just as much as at stake, and because that was sort of a time limited thing, it's this is an emergency. We just need to get as many people out to vote, and you know, don't don't waste your time convincing people who can't be convinced. So now, I I, I have to say, I I think that we can't do much that's effective without serious structural change. Why is Fox News allowed to exist? I mean, the the two best-selling books right now, um, at least 
right now. <laughs> I'm going to try to do something about that. But one is called American Marxism, and the oh, other gosh. one is called Woke Inc. And they are both, I mean, I'm, I haven't read them. I'm not going to read them. But the premise of both of them is that critical race theory is destroying America. They don't even know what it is, or they're lying about knowing what it is. So how I get the First Amendment is very important, but how is it possible that lies are time after time given as much room, as much time, as much validity as truth? It, it kind of mystifies me. I know it's a slippery slope. However, we're talking about lies that are getting people killed. We're talking about lies that are destroying the potential for American democracy. We're talking about lies that are leading us to the brink of the failure of the American experiment. What do we do about that? Because it's pervasive. People go off and they live in their bubbles. You know, they, there are not two realities. There's one reality. A lot of people are choosing not to live in it. This is a, this is a cultural problem. And because of that, I don't know really what can be done on an individual level, because you can have a conversation with somebody who thinks the election was stolen, who thinks that the insurrectionists were patriots, who thinks Donald's going to be reinstated. And again, I, I mean, and this is how I feel about um, the uh, Democrats and bipartisanship. You cannot make common cause with people who either refuse to acknowledge reality or are not acknowledging reality because it is useful for them to lie about it. You can't make common cause with a, a political party that no longer believes in American democracy. So if you're having trying to have that conversation with an individual who believes all of those things, none of which is true, you can't say, oh, we'll agree to disagree. And I'm not entirely, because no, they're wrong. <laughs> As you say, Jill, facts are facts. It's not a question. I don't care if you believe in climate change. I don't care if you believe the election was stolen. Not that it's not true. Facts are the climate is changing catastrophically. Facts are the election was as free and as fair as an American election can be at the moment. Joe Biden won. He's the president, et cetera. So I sometimes feel that that like making that effort would be absolutely useful and and valuable and um commendable if that person weren't going back into the bubble in which case everything you said is going to disappear from memory within 5 seconds so it's it's a terrible it's a terrible place to be in. And unfortunately, I think the, the solution to it is a very long-term one. And it's, uh, it's a two-part strategy. One, we need to start teaching civics again. And two, we need to start teaching our children critical thinking. Because, uh, yes. you know, now that they're not learning critical race theory, they'll have all that extra time. <laughs> well, I was going to follow up my more general question um, with one about how to have a personal conversation with someone who is a Trump supporter. But I and, and I'm not going to give up just because you said it's a waste of time. Uh, I still think there has to be some way to get past when you love someone and respect them to yeah. try to save them from these falsehoods. But for now, I'll move on to- You're right. And, and I, I apologize. Yeah. I just, it makes me kind of angry because I don't, I, you know, when people ask me if I'm angry about the people who wear masks and stuff like that, yeah, I am. But yeah. at the same time, you can't blame them entirely. They're listening to people they trust with yes. whom, in whom yeah. they've placed their trust by voting for them and putting them into power. So I, I'm sorry. I, that was a little extreme. Right. What I will say <laughs> is this, though, um, that if you love, care, and respect, care about and respect the person, then it is never a waste of time. But maybe the way in isn't to say, you know, I disagree. That's not true. But to say, 
if you're a good person, and let's assume for the sake of argument, you are, because I love you and I only love people who are good people, then how do you explain the violence that was inflicted upon Capitol Police officers on January 6th? How do you explain the cruelty of all of, uh, you know, with many of these policies that were advocated, like the, you know, putting children in concentration camps? How do you, the good person you are, deal with the fact that because of, um, you know, incompetence and malicious unwillingness to tell the truth and to make the hard decisions, children are dying because their parents won't get them vaccinated because their parents have been lied to repeatedly. How do you, how do you, how do you good person make sense of that? How do you deal with that? How do you allow that not to change how you think about things? I think that's a good approach. Um, and then, so I want to ask. Yeah, that's better than my first yeah. <laughs> take on it. <laughs> no, that was that was also good and real, uh, very real. But um, <laughs> since this is uh, iGen politics, which is intergenerational politics, and Victor and I are from obviously very different generations, you talk about uh, in your book generational trauma, um, and so I'd like to move into that area and how it can be passed on down, so that. The trauma of 9-11, the trauma of Vietnam, the, you know, all of these traumas get passed on. And so maybe a, a brief description of how our national history has created generational trauma. Um, and, and racism, I mean, that's got to be a national trauma for sure. Um, so let's, let's talk about that. Well, starting with um, the beginning. Right. Uh, we, white America, enslaved um, an entire race of people. They committed genocide against two different races of people, including the native population and obviously the African population that was kidnapped and brought here um, and then subjected to decades and generations of torture, rape, murder, and just the most unspeakable depravity. Um, you know, I know a lot of people don't like to face that, but that is our history. And because we don't face it, we're continuing to deal with it because, you know, as I said earlier, the only way to make it through trauma, and again, you can't cure it, but you can learn how to deal with it, is to face it. So after the Civil War, uh, enslaved people were freed, but then nothing <laughs> much else was done to make them part of our society or our democracy. I mean, the, the, the franchise was achieved, but within 12 years at the end of Reconstruction, Black people in the South were once again living essentially in a closed fascist state and had been terrorized out of their ability to vote. So imagine how that changed the uh, culture of the South and how it changed the political landscape of America and continues to to this day. So if you are traumatized in the ways enslaved people were, were trying, and it's unspeakable, like it's unimaginable, we cannot imagine the levels of trauma these human beings were subjected to at the hands of other human beings. Um, and then their children are also born in bondage, subjected to the same things. It's never, they're, you know, they're not treated like human beings. So of course it's never addressed. It's never, uh, you know, there's no attempt to healing. It's not recognized. It's not acknowledged. That, that was eight generations worth of people. And, I don't, I don't think much changed in the 100 years of Jim Crow between the Civil War and the Voting Rights Act of 18, 1965. So that's bad enough, right? Because if you're traumatized to that degree, what kind of bond do you have with your child? If you know that there's a very real possibility that child is going to be taken from you at any given moment or murdered in front of you, if you do the wrong thing, 
what, what does that do to a parent-child bond? What does that do to the child growing up, in some cases, essentially parentless? And then, as I said, it didn't end with the Civil War. Um, Brian Stevenson, who uh, is the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, has said slavery didn't end in 1865. It evolved. And that's what happened in Jim Crow. That's what happened with the Black Codes that, again, disenfranchised people and basically made it possible for white people to torture, rape, and murder Black people with impunity throughout the 20th century. So that adds to the trauma that's already been handed down to you. I mean, this exists at a biological level. It's called epigenetics, but also just from a psychological perspective. It's, it's incredibly um, powerful and negative force that gets compounded. And it's compounded again when uh, with the war on drugs. It's compounded again by the de jure segregation of our neighborhoods and our schools. And it's compounded again with the modern day equivalent of lynching. When you cannot be a black person in this country, leave your house and be absolutely confident that you're not going to get killed by a police officer. So we have a lot to grapple with. We have a lot to atone for, but it has to start with acknowledging it that for generations now, this trauma has been passed down and worse, it's been compounded because we fail to grapple with the original traumas. Boy, that is so powerful. And uh, what it made me envision as you were talking was I recently had the opportunity to visit the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis. And I was traumatized in many of the exhibits. When you see the recreation of a slave ship and the conditions that human beings were kept in to be brought here. When you see the bus that Rosa Parks sat in, when you see the timeline, I think this was maybe one of the most traumatic of voting registration among uh, black citizens. It went up right after reconstruction or during reconstruction, right after the war. But then Jim Crow Mm -hmm. came, and so the line goes up, and then it falls off. And we have not gotten back to the number that were registered right after the Civil War. That is traumatizing to me. And um, so I'm going to ask one more question about this topic, which is you sort of suggest that accountability is the way to deal with this. And I just want to see whether we're doing enough to hold accountable what's going on now. Is the Fulton County DA doing enough? Is Cyrus Vance doing enough? Is Merrick Garland doing enough? Is Are all of us as citizens doing enough to make sure that the Voting Rights Act passes, that John Lewis Act passes, that people get registered, um, and that we hold accountable people responsible for January 6th, Etc. Uh, yeah, and and the other thing I, I just would add a, a, a historical note is that um, during Reconstruction, Mississippi had two black senators. Yes, exactly. So imagine. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So no, we're not doing enough. Nobody's doing enough. Um, I I don't know if Merrick Garland's doing anything, which terrifies me. I have to hope that he is, because if he doesn't, and you know, fail failing to hold people accountable is another way of traumatizing others. So, you know, I mentioned Robert E. Lee. Uh, he suffered practically no consequences for being a traitor to America and starting fighting a war against America in which seven hundred and fifty thousand people were killed. So um, for that, for those in indescribable crimes against humanity, he was made president of Washington University. And then after he died, it was also named after him. So it was named the Washington and Lee University. To make it worse, Robert E. Lee, who owned other human beings and tortured them and betrayed his country, was pardoned by Gerald Ford. 
what it what imagine being a descendant of in, of an enslaved be- person and like how how do you comprehend how do you take that in so no we're not doing enough the democrats have to understand that our lives are at stake here they need to get rid of the filibuster they need to um and I know, I know some of this is controversial, but I don't care. I mean, the Republicans have been have been stealing from us. They have been burning the rule book. So I'm I'm not talking about you know stepping out of line in order to uh, do harm like they do, or in order to destroy our country like they do. I'm talking about just having the guts to make hard decisions that may be unpopular, that may be, you know, cross a line here and there, but that ultimately will save our democracy. Get rid of the filibuster, add five seats to the Supreme Court, double the size of the federal judiciary, balance what has become totally out of balance because of people like Mitch McConnell, who has turned the federal judiciary into an entity that does not represent 70 percent of the American people. So no, we're not doing enough. And uh, listen, if Donald gets held accountable because he cheated on his taxes and that's the only thing that happens, well, I guess it's better than nothing, but it's not enough. Like you said earlier, we need to get your book to to the top two and we encourage all of our audience to buy your book. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to end our podcast. I, I'm not going to end my podcast or this podcast with these three questions because I want to ask something else to end it on a lighter note. But I do want to ask you about the possibility that something might happen that no one would hope um, would happen, which is the possibility of Donald Trump running for office again. Um, How likely do you think that is based on what you know about him? Um, And I guess, like, what happens if he does? Um, That that sort of just makes me want to go on, like, a permanent vacation. But, uh, again, we we can't do that. Um, I would, if you had asked me that question in December, I would have said, absolutely not. He's such a coward. He was so humiliated. He would never put himself in a position to lose like that again. Um, and then along come our friends, the Republicans and uh, again, allow him to perpetuate the big lie, allow him to get away with inciting an armed insurrection against our government. So he feels as he always has been immune to any consequences. And on top of that um, are all the voter suppression laws we talked about earlier. So if it got to the point where Donald felt that if he ran, he couldn't lose, why wouldn't he run? And that's, I think, what the Republicans are trying to engineer because they know that there is nobody else on their side in a position to run who has whatever it is Donald has. Does, you know, who has that charisma, so to speak. Hawley doesn't have it. Cruz doesn't have it. Cotton doesn't have it. None of my cousins has it, that's for sure. So that, I think, is is their uh, agenda right now. And if he does run, um, if he does run, and those of us who who care about this country and care about the future of the planet, because imagine what would happen if the most powerful country on the planet became an autocracy. Um, if we don't treat that uh, as if our hair were on fire, then I don't, I don't know. Boy, I, th- I, I don't know. I think you've inspired me uh, and encouraged me to make sure that I do everything possible in terms of voting rights and elections and I'm going to work really hard because of of this discussion with you. And I can't thank you enough for spending the time with us and the time that it took to write this book and think through the solutions. And as Victor said, everybody go out and buy Mary Trump's book, Reckoning, and learn from it and follow her advice here, which is to do something constructive. Get involved and take action. If you can't bear to hear Donald Trump's voice, well, luckily we don't hear it that much anymore on most media outlets. But if you can't bear to just follow all the horrible news that's happening, you do need to be informed somehow. So make sure you don't lose that. But you can, even without knowing that, 
you know that there are things that need doing in your community, go and do them. And uh, we'll look forward to hearing from all of you who are listening or watching as to what steps you're going to take to be involved to solve the problems of this country and to thank Mary Trump for writing this book and being with us today. Thank you. It's such a pleasure talking with you. Um, I'm sorry it's so heavy, and but that's where we are. Great. And but what I a really great picture this is of you with Sebastian on your shoulder. Yes. I love it. Thank you so much, Mary. Really appreciate it. <laughs> thank, thank you, you Mary. This is awesome. Stay safe. So, Jill, we had Mary on the podcast in December of 2020. I'm wondering what your reactions are to our interview today. I First of all, it's hard for me to believe that December of 2020 is only eight months ago. I, it feels like we are in a different world. Um, I thought both interviews with Mary were terrific, that she's a great guest. She's very thoughtful. I thought the first one gave great insight into who her uncle was and what was motivating him. And this one, I thought, gave a lot of insight into what our democracy is, what our country is, who we are, and also how personal trauma is. That It's not just that we're all traumatized by the events, but each of us has our own personal trauma. And I, I felt really good about that. Um, I, I also was very interested. She mentioned two things that I wanted to ask you about. One was critical race theory. And the other was um, basically media literacy. And Illinois just passed a law, uh, Governor Pritzker just signed it into law, requiring that students be taught media literacy. And while you and I have often talked about how important it is for people to get critical thinking skills, and we would have added if we had been asked, media literacy skills, the idea that it's being taught in, for example, Southern Illinois, not just in Evanston, where I am, means that the teacher teaching it is going to have a very dramatic impact on the students they're training. And so now I'm sort of, I am a little worried about how it will be implemented. Did you have anything like that when you were in high school? First, I think Illinois is making amazing strides, at least when it comes to transforming the classroom. They also passed um, a bill that would mandate Asian American history in the classrooms yes. um, in middle school and high school, which is uh, a step forward uh, for other states to follow as well. But I, I shared your concerns. Um, I sent you that article and, and we talked about the concern that we had, especially in Southern Illinois, because we live in Northern Illinois. We live in the suburbs of Chicago. And in our area, the teachers are you don't see many Trump supporters as teachers. Um, but once you get to Southern Illinois, it's like you see a lot of those um, people who you could see on TV protesting, you know, mask mandates or um, definitely supporting Trump openly. But I agree. I think the intentions of this bill are so needed. I think we need to teach students how to be aware of misinformation, disinformation, how to detect that, how to combat it. Um, but as you say, I think the, the the complication is, you know, once you get to Southern Illinois, or once you get to teachers or parents or students who get their sources from Breitbart, Fox, OANN. It's, um, I think, a, a really complicated and could be dangerous situation for um, how that curriculum is taught. But I think the intentions are great. I think if we can find a way to yeah. somehow teach this in like a nonpartisan way, if that's even possible, um, that would be ideal. But um, also in terms of critical race theory, I know I wasn't taught critical race theory. What I was taught, however, was how to be a person who recognizes that our society um, has gone through so much racism towards Black Americans that we've dealt with, you know, this um, society that hasn't lived up to um, the ideals that we promised in our um, Constitution, Declaration of Independence, and um, I think a lot of that is being misidentified as critical race theory, which has become this um, culture war issue for Republicans. But no one is teaching critical race theory, which I think, as, as you would know, is something that is taught during law school, not during, not right. in elementary and middle schools. But I think a lot of the steps that Illinois um, are taking is is good. It's just finding a way about how we can implement that without causing some well, sort of execution. Protest in Illinois. Execution is always 
the important thing, whether it's in yeah. evacuations from Afghanistan or in execution of this new well-intentioned law to make sure that students do get the kind of critical thinking skills and media literacy. Um, I, those are I do all have one question wonderful for you, Jill. Yeah, I do have one question for you, Jill, because we often do talk about civics and the importance of students learning civics. What was it like during your day? Um, were you mandated to take any civics classes? Um, because I, I know in my school we were, but a lot of Illinois schools, or I guess a lot of schools across the country, don't mandate civics anymore as a um, condition to graduate. I guess it depends on how you define civics. We certainly were taught that there are three branches of government. Uh, we learned the basic rules of the Constitution, which unfortunately, you know, if you stop 100 people on the street, uh, I'm not sure how many of them know there are three branches and what they are um, and what the relationships are between them and what the role of the Supreme Court is. I think those are essential things for people to exercise their vote. You can't vote if you don't understand the structure of government. So I think that's really important. And going back to critical race theory, um, I read a really interesting article uh, in one of the Columbia alumni magazines by three professors who are teaching critical race theory. And it is a law school uh, philosophical issue. It isn't something that is being taught in grade schools. So we're using the wrong terminology when we talk about uh, that critical race theory shouldn't be taught. Uh, black history should be taught. And that includes some of the ugly parts of American history. But if we don't know it, um, then how can we make this a better world? And I think our goal here on this podcast is to inform and educate so that pe people can get involved to make this a better world. And I think, I think we can and we must. So folks, if you're listening, Get involved. Do something that is uh, positive, that will help you feel better, whether it's you know supporting a charity through financial contribution or through volunteering to help serve in a food kitchen. Whatever it is, please get involved and do it. Um, my father always taught me, just do it. Don't ask who else is doing it. Just do what you think is right. So I hope that people will take that advice. That's the perfect way to end. And I know I enjoy this conversation. So did you, Jill. And I hope that you also enjoy this, um, our listeners, our viewers. Um, we're going to have a brand new episode of iGen Politics next week. But um, feel free to share our podcast wherever you follow it, wherever you um, download it on YouTube. Um, and then we'll see you next week. Thanks so much for listening. Mm -hmm.